Wars are raging around the world. Many are pitting East against West, with both supplying arms to countries they support. The United Nations has been accused of weakness, paralysed by vetoes held by the major powers. So could these global conflicts turn into a third world war? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tom McRae. A global conflict has been avoided since 1945 and the end of World War II and its horrors of the Holocaust and atomic bombs dropped on Japan by the US. Now, much of today's international political architecture, such as the United Nations, stems from the aftermath formed by world leaders determined such a disaster would never happen again. Yet conditions comparable to those in World War II are being suffered by many people today, such as in Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, Yemen, Myanmar and Central Africa, to mention but a few. And in recent years, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed or injured in Syria, Libya, Iraq and Afghanistan as a result of foreign military action, often with East and West backing different sides. But up until now, there's been no outright fighting between Russia or China and the US. But serious conflicts or standoffs between their allies are ongoing. United Nations peacemaking efforts have frequently been limited by deadlock in the Security Council. So is there a real danger of such global conflict erupting into a third world war? We'll be asking our guests this question and many more in just a few moments. But first, Imogen Kimber reports on where the current flashpoints are. Carnage and destruction on an unprecedented scale in Gaza, with 100,000 people either dead or injured. <laughs> President Joe Biden said from the outset of Israel's war on Gaza, the US did not want conflict to escalate to other countries, despite sending weapons and warships. Yet its impact is being felt across the region, with concerns growing that it could spread. This is an incredibly volatile time in the Middle East. Um, I would argue that we have not seen a situation as, as dangerous as the one we're facing now across the region since at least 1973, and arguably uh, even, uh, even before that. Linked to Israel's Gaza war in neighboring Jordan, three US soldiers were killed in a drone strike, blamed on an Iranian-backed militia in Iraq that's still recovering from the catastrophic war launched by the West 21 years ago. And in southern Lebanon, the Iranian-backed armed group Hezbollah quickly joined the fight, with ongoing exchanges of fire with Israeli forces across the border. Another group allied to Iran, the Houthis in Yemen, is attacking Western cargo ships, saying it's a retaliation for Israel's war on Gaza and to support the Palestinians. The US and UK have begun bombing Yemen in response. The US, together with the UK and some of their other allies, have violated and trampled on all conceivable norms of international law, including the UN Security Council resolution, which only called for protecting commercial navigation. Nobody authorised anyone to bomb Yemen. In Europe, as NATO and Western states continue to send weapons and financial support to Ukraine two years after Russia's invasion, there are fears the conflict could spread across the continent. Countries in Europe have been increasing their military preparedness, with long-time neutral Finland joining NATO and neutral Sweden close to doing the same. Moving east, the US and China have both been carrying out military exercises in the South China Sea, with intensifying focus on Taiwan that Beijing claims as part of its territory, to be taken by force if necessary. And there is rising tension on the Korean Peninsula, with North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un saying unification is no longer a possibility. South Korea and Japan are strengthening their military forces, while Russia has become a stronger ally of Pyongyang since its invasion of Ukraine. Conflicts are also raging elsewhere, with war in Sudan and volatility in South Sudan. That follows the war in neighbouring Ethiopia's Tigray region, in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed and where tensions remain high. With more confrontations pitting East directly against West, many are now questioning whether the world is sliding towards a wider global conflict, along with the horror that would bring. 
Imogen Kimber, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Okay, let's bring in our guests now. In New York is Chris Hedges, former Middle East Bureau Chief of the New York Times and a Pulitzer Prize winner. In Birmingham, UK, Scott Lucas is a professor at University College Dublin and edits EA Worldview that provides news and analysis through those facing conflict, deprivation and change. And in Beijing, Hui Yao Henry Huang is the founder and president of the Centre for China and Globalisation and a former councillor to China's State Council, which is China's cabinet. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for joining us here on Inside Story. If we could start uh, broadly and then uh, focus in, uh, drill down on the specific conflicts that are happening around the world at this point in time. Chris, if I can begin with you. What do you make of the premise that we're sliding inevitably towards World War III? I don't know that anything is inevitable, but these conflicts are very dangerous because whatever the intentions, and I don't think that Iran, Hezbollah, or the United States seek a regional conflict uh, by exacerbating uh, tensions within the regions through strikes and counter-strikes, whether that's in Yemen, whether that's in Iraq, uh, whether that's in southern Lebanon, uh, you propel yourself closer and closer to a conflict. I think what concerns me as an American most is that the inner circle around Joe Biden, that's Antony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, and Brett McGurk, have no real understanding of the Middle East. In the case of Blinken, he sees the Middle East through the lens of the Netanyahu government. None of them speak Arabic. None of them are particularly familiar with the culture or the history or the even the grievances. That's when we saw Blinken essentially go around and try and lobby Arab leaders to take Palestinian refugees from Gaza. Um, it just shows how tone deaf he is. All of these people are strong militarists. Sullivan, of course, stoking the tensions primarily with China. Uh, and uh, but but uh, but Biden himself, who was calling for war with Iraq five years before the U.S. invaded, uh, and that's what worries me the most. It's this kind of incompetence, uh, historical, linguistic, cultural, mm. I would say even political illiteracy, and then the ability to bypass Congress to not only funnel weapons, billions in weapons to sustain the genocide in Gaza, but carry out strikes, whether that's in Yemen or Iraq or anywhere else, uh, essentially without consulting Congress. So from an American perspective, uh, this is a very dangerous development in, within the State Department and the intelligence community. Uh, many people consider what uh, these three people around Biden are doing as very ill-advised and very dangerous. So uh, this incompetence is something that uh, worries me tremendously uh, the, especially the longer that uh, the conflict in Gaza continues, and I don't see any any signs within the Biden administration that they have any intention of stopping it. Indeed, they spend most of their time in Jerusalem and Riyadh. Yeah, indeed. Uh, we heard uh, Blinken in the story uh, we played at the beginning of this show basically say that the world is more dangerous now than at any time in the last 50 years. Scott, do you believe those words? Do you see it the same way? I don't like to use terms like World War III or even Cold War 2.0 for two reasons. Uh, the first is it leads to exaggeration, which means we miss looking at each case on an individual basis. And secondly, it leads to sweeping generalizations to blame a particular group like Chris has just done. What I would point you to is to say, look, we have had a series of conflicts around the world for some time, but the stakes have been raised uh, in the past few years probably by three catalysts. The first is, before the current Israel-Gaza conflict, we saw the bloody repression of movements across the Middle East, especially mm. in Syria, where the Assad regime, backed by Russia, killed hundreds of thousands of people. Secondly, we saw the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine in February 2022. And then, of course, we had Hamas's mass killings in Israel, followed by Israel's mass killings that continue on a daily basis killing tens of thousands in Gaza. And each of those flashpoints, each of those catalysts can be used by various actors, not just the US, can be used by Russia, can be used by China, can be used by someone else to push their local power plays 
And when you have an intersection of different conflicts, let's say between Israel, Gaza, Syria, Iran, and Iraq, then you have the possibility that a particular conflict can expand into the region and then beyond. Mm, right. Uh, Henry, I'd like to get uh, the sense of what it is like in China. It feels like in the West, there has been, in recent days, more and more talk of this concept of World War III being closer than ever before. Is there any talk or concern within China of this? Well, I think absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, uh, even though <clears throat> this just seems a bit far from China, but absolutely it's really uh, affected China also, because China, uh, uh, you know, being the largest trading nation in the world, I mean, we, we have actually heavily dependent on those uh, traffic and those, uh, uh, you know, ocean shipping and uh, all those import exports. So uh, what I see is the, the world is really getting more dangerous. I agree. I mean, the world is getting more dangerous and more risky. And uh, I mean, there's two, two, two levels of that. First, I think there's, a, uh, there's a, you know, all those uh, regional issues uh, because we are getting into a multipolar world and then uh, there's no multipolar world system to sustain that. So we see that, uh, you know, if there's no consensus, then there's a lot of regional conflicts, you know, s spread around. I mean, you know, because uh, uh, Russian war in Ukraine is one example, but also we have seen this uh, uh, Palestinian-Israel conflict, which is which is very deadly and it's spread over. In fact, mm. is 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 getting loom and large and, and affecting uh, all the big countries. I mean, U.S. UK uh, jumping already, and then Iran it could. <laughs> fight back, and then that could spill over even more countries. And then yeah. you see the whole world disrupted trade and, and everything. So the second, I think, is most important is there's there's a, there's a no trust between the major powers. And the P5 member country of the UN basically is not really working together. And that's really, I think, probably can be the one of the main reasons that the world can't get its act together to really maintain the stability and order. So I think mm. we have to really think about how we can maintain this peace I mean, like China suggests that, like Israel-Palestinian conflict, let's have a war peace summit. You know, have a high-level summit, and really let's go come to the table and talk about that, rather yeah. than you know we 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 see only one country back and forth, and that's really not help. So we we need to really think hard and find solution to this going crisis. Yeah, I don't think many people would disagree that uh, trust is probably at its lowest point ever between uh, the major players here. Uh, Chris, if I can go back to you, you're obviously scathing uh, about Biden, President Biden and, and the US's handling of what has happened in Gaza. Since October the 7th, base, almost on a daily basis, they've said that they don't want this war to escalate, to uh, broaden out into a, in a, into a regional war. But since then, we have seen it creep to more and more countries, whether it's Yemen or Lebanon, uh, into, into other countries like that. What they are saying is very different from what they are doing, isn't it? Yeah, because the war could not be sustained without U.S. munitions, which have come in by the tens of thousands. Uh, the, the tank shells, uh, the, the artillery shells, everything else is produced in the United States. They've, of course, uh, vetoed the ceasefire resolution. So on the one hand, they want it contained. On the other hand, they fuel the conflict. Uh, mm. And uh, that, of course, is a contradiction in terms of goals. If you want to uh, mitigate the possibilities of a regional conflict, you have to end the genocide that Israel is carrying out in Gaza. Uh, and, and I would say that, you know, the Arab regimes, countries like Egypt in particular, uh, th they don't want to see this escalate but of course, within the street, I just came back from the Middle East, in fact, was in Doha visiting Al Jazeera, uh, the anger is, is, uh, is quite widespread and quite palpable. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, so, yes, the, I, I blame the Biden administration for not using its leverage. It has the leverage. Uh, but because Congress is bought and paid for by the Israel lobby, uh, it's not going to use it. There's a political cost uh, that Biden doesn't want to pay. And so, uh, we're, look, we're watching a situation now where uh, there's widespread famine. 500,000 Palestinians are at starvation level. Infectious diseases are spreading. Palestinians are eating grass. 90 percent of them are unhoused. Many living in the open under the rain of the winter rains. I mean, this is just mm. uh, staggering in terms of 
the catastrophe that has been, the humanitarian catastrophe that has been orchestrated and it quite rightly uh, triggers a reaction. Uh, remember, Yemen itself uh, suffered like this, 400,000. I think Yemenis died yeah. during the war and siege led by Saudi Arabia with, with the full backing of the United States. So, of course, they're reacting because they understand. But yes, it's uh, I really think the blame lies at this moment with Washington for not intervening and using the power that it has to end uh, this conflict or at least bring out, uh, bring forth a ceasefire yeah. or a prolonged pause. Okay. Scott, is this all the United States' fault, though, the, the prolonged killing on a daily basis of Palestinians in Gaza because they have, I guess, backed unilaterally Israel? And do you think that the conflict in Gaza and in the Middle East at this point in time is the one that's most likely to, I guess, spread further and, and potentially uh, escalate to become a world war? I mean, I agree with Chris. Uh, in a sense, and I've been a scathing critic of American actions in recent months because they're not using leverage to try to pull the Israelis back. But one of the problems we have in a lot of commentary is, is it's only about the United States. It needs to be widened out. And let me give you two examples with Israel and Gaza. The first is, is that the U.S., along with much of the international community, did try to hold the Netanyahu war cabinet back from a ground offensive they tried to hold them back from an expansive bombing campaign uh, after October 7th. And at the end of the day, you have to say that the agency, the decision to go out with that all-out campaign, that masculine inside Gaza, is with the Israeli war cabinet. It's not that the U.S. told them to do so. The U.S. didn't mm. want this to happen. But the second example I think is pertinent is, is that there are others in the region, not just the U.S. who are involved, and there are others who will take advantage of this for their own purposes. So, for example, the Houthi uh, rebels who control much of Yemen are attacking commercial shipping in the Red Sea on the guise of supporting Gazans, but also to advance their legitimacy, their power in the area. Iran, which has serious domestic problems, is trying to use the regional conflict to say, well, we're the head of the axis of resistance. And that is leading to increased confrontations, not only between Iran and Israel, mm. but between the Iran-backed militia who are firing on U.S. personnel. So there's a kaleidoscope of actors I think we have to get in sight. And very quickly on your question, I think the Israel-Gaza uh, conflict can definitely expand to be a regional war because of all of this. But also, don't forget that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could expand across Europe if Vladimir Putin continues to pursue that idea of an expansionist policy to knock back, quote, the West and NATO, as mm. well as to try to control Kyiv. Yeah. Well, the United Nations was effectively set up to try and prevent uh, conflicts like this, and, and especially sp um, stopping them from spreading even further. But many critics of the United Nations have basically said that they're weak, they're paralysed uh, by the major powers using vetoes constantly. Henry, what do you think needs to happen at the United Nations. You, you were talking about, you know, the major powers coming together. But, I mean, what is the likelihood of that actually happening? And even if you could get them in the same room, how openly are they going to be able to talk and actually find any solutions here? Well, I think absolutely. We probably need also, uh, uh, you know, reform you a bit. But I think, you know, maybe let's get a, a, a majority vote or something, you know, I mean... <clears throat> Uh, that uh, that uh, that we cannot just uh, uh, you know uh, have one country veto. For example, I mean that last time uh, when when China proposed the uh, resolution for uh, Palestinian-Israel conflict, uh, I mean U.S. vetoed that. So, yeah. uh, so what? Sorry, what Henry, think, you know, we, we would, would to... China actually support that? No, I think you you know of course there 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 there's uh, there's when China was the rotating uh, chair of the of uh, UN uh, Security Council I think last November I mean there, there was uh, quite a bit uh, talking uh, discussion on that and China even called for a global summit on this crisis so I think we need to do that we need to really have a high level talk and uh, and talk about uh, how we can uh, really uh, reform that and but but let's come to the consensus I think it's important to have the uh, high level summit. Let's get yeah. the, the five okay. uh, head of the state of the uh, UN Scott, Security I can, Council. Matter. Sorry to interrupt again, Henry. Scott, I can see you nodding away there. What do you make of, of what Henry has just had to say? Well, I think on the specifics of the UN, I think you asked an interesting question, and that is, would China support getting rid of the veto 
power in the Security Council, which has not only been used by Russia to hold up the Security Council and by the U.S. to hold up the Security Council, but China would have to give up its own veto Mm. as well. So certainly, UN reform has to involve all major powers. But on a wider issue, and I'd be interested in Henry's thoughts on this, where I think U.S.-China may be different from the other crises we talk about is it looks like there's a concerted effort by the Biden administration and by China to get back to the rules of the game, whether that's the rules of the game over Taiwan, the South China Sea, over economic issues, over technical issues, or technological issues, including the issue of espionage. What do you mean by rules of the game? game, I think rules of the game, and and I'll refer back to the other issues and then get back to China, is, is that with Russia and Ukraine, and in the sense of order across Europe, Vladimir Putin violated the rules of the game in a conflict which has been going on since 2014, including Russian occupation of part of the country, by launching a direct military invasion. That's crossing a red line. Hamas broke well, the rules of the yeah, game well, well, with the nature with the nature of its attack on Israel on October 7th because it carried out the mass killing of civilians. And then, of course, Israel breaks the rules of the game on a day upon mm. day upon day basis with its indiscriminate war. With the U.S. and China, after a period of heightened tension in 2022, including over Taiwan, including over military issues. There has been an effort in the past year on both sides, including a series of high-level meetings in Beijing, to say, look, let's step back from confrontation. Let's agree to live and let live over a specific issue over China and over broader issues like economic and trade issues. Uh, Henry, I I know you wanted to jump in there. Can you just, uh, first of all, uh, before you respond uh, to Scott, can you just reiterate... Would China actually be prepared to give up its veto powers at the UN? No, no, I'm not saying that. I think that have to discuss the uh, UN reform. I mean, that's not China, uh, just one country. I mean, we have all the countries talk together. Well, I think on this uh, Palestinian-Israel conflict, we need to have a high-level UN summit. Let's get all the top uh, top leaders to to, to come to the table. And also, you know, uh, Security Council member. Uh, uh, countries at the table. I think the one of the fundamental problem, what what we see happen in the Russian Ukrainian war and all, all uh, across uh, Taiwan Street, or what what we see at the Palestinian Israel conflict, is basically the fundamental loss to trust of the of the major powers. And then the reason for that is that some countries are unilaterally pursue a lot of policy, you know, when decouple the risk and whatever. So that really created a lot of mistrust. And also, uh, uh, you know, when when this uh, the sec- when the, when the Cold War ended, I mean, also the, you know, there's a lot of things mm. has not been happening, and uh, so I think the mistrust of the major powers led to this regional conflict, led to, led to this regional, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, destabilized. So basically, okay. the, the root of the problem is is lies in the major countries. We have yes. to really put all the major countries at the table and talk and 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 get the normalize their relation. That's the most important thing. Not view each other as enemy rivalry. I mean, if the major power view each other as rivalry, uh, uh, you know, enemy, and how can they really solve the regional problem where they have the profit war and whatever? You know, that's yes. really very bad. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the leaders that are basically going to be making any decisions going forward here. You've got Putin, Biden, or potentially Trump later this year, Netanyahu. Xi, Kim Jong-un, all uh, taking, you know, front row seats and uh, controlling what is going to happen next. Chris, I know you've been scathing uh, about many of of these leaders. Are they the types of leaders that would be able to de-escalate, to take the tension out of the room, so to speak, uh, to bring us back from the brink of, of a World War III? Well, some of them. I mean, Netanyahu has long lobbied for a war with Iran. Uh, he, the Israel lobby was a major factor in pushing the United States into Iraq, although it had nothing to do with the attacks of 9-11. I really think the core issue here is the expansion of U.S. militarism. Remember, we spend more on our military than what the next nine or ten countries combined, including China and Russia. I, I covered Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, including the fall of East Germany in 1989 as a reporter. And I was there when the promises were made to Gorbachev not to extend NATO beyond the borders of a unified Germany. WikiLeaks released a, a cable written by William Burns, who was the ambassador to Russia, now the head of the CIA, who said Ukraine is a red line. 
Uh, mm. Essentially incorporating Ukraine into NATO is a provocation. It doesn't matter what your political perspective is that is unacceptable to the Russian people. I'm paraphrasing. And so that expansion of NATO up to Russia's borders, uh, the inability on the United States to intervene 16 years, 2.3 million Gazans living in a concentration camp. Uh, th these are, uh, we have to put these things in context. The massive expansion of the U.S. military in the South China Sea. Uh, these are all provocations. And uh, I, I, I fear that unless uh, this expansionist policy uh, that defines U.S. militarism is not put under control. I think that is the engine that is driving so much of uh, the okay. instability, the global uh, instability, I really think. And, and there was no reason for the war in Ukraine. Uh, mm. I mean, in fact, after a couple years of savage bloodletting, uh, in which Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians are killed and wounded and much of the country destroyed, you're yeah. going to end up with a negotiation that could have been done before. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I can see you oh, you're shaking your head almost right the way through uh, mm -hmm. what Chris was saying. We've mm -hmm. only got a couple of minutes left. Can you just give uh, your response, please? The general response is that, you know, stop using the U.S. as a punching bag or as a diversion. Yes, the U.S. and its military are to blame for a lot of what is going on such as the 2003 war in Iraq, but it wasn't the U.S. military that invaded Ukraine and continues to attack Ukraine on a daily basis. That was Vladimir Putin. Mm. It wasn't the U.S. that attacked Israel or that attacked Gaza. That's Hamas and Israel that are involved there. And if you just simply shout, shout, shout about U.S. militarism, you forget the fact that this is a very complex system, such as the complex system in China, and you rule out the possibility that the U.S. and China can find a way forward together because you're simply shaking your fist and saying, well, Washington's always going to be the bad guy. It's too simplistic and it doesn't help us as analysts. Yeah. OK. It, well, finally, let, me, let me just say, uh, Scott, I, do, I don't think that Washington's always the bad guy, but I spent 20 years on the outer reaches of empire covering U.S. militarism and proxy wars in Latin America and everywhere else. And uh, th there is no control anymore. It's a state within a state. And uh, yes, certainly there I'm are sorry, other I'm actors. sorry, Chris. Sorry, Chris. You're a good reporter, but as an analyst in 2023-24, you're giving up the job of reporting on a daily basis where this is not just angels versus devils. No, there are good people and there are bad people. I didn't say it was angels. I did not say it was. Assistance. It's not. It's not so, angels versus devils. I'm no defender of Vladimir Putin, and he so what he committed was a war crime. But I think not to acknowledge that he was baited and provoked. It doesn't defend what he does. He was it not baited. And, the he was not baited. He was not baited and provoked. And you've just defended Vladimir Putin by using that inaccurate assessment. That's what I mean about uh, sticking well, Scott, with facts. Well, Scott, I, I, I covered. I was there in Eastern. No. I covered it. I covered it. I was there as a reporter. I watched but the it, whole process. So you were not. I, I strongly disagree. I, I, I don't think okay. that. You, you were. We're you, going to have to leave it there. there. We really do appreciate your time, uh, gentlemen, uh, Chris, Scott, and Henry. Thank you very much for your time and your insights uh, here on Inside Story. Thank you. Well, thank you also for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X, our handle is at AJ Inside Story. Well, from me, Tom McRae and the whole team here, goodbye for now.